to the National Arts Club Knack at Home program. I'm Angela Louie. I am the co-chair of the fashion committee at the National Arts Club. For those who are hearing about us for the first time, we are a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we are so excited to discuss Black dandyism and Black diasporic identity. Here to talk about this is Professor Monica L. Miller, author of Slaves to Fashion, Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Diasporic Identity, which is the book on Black Dandyism. It takes place in 18th century England, and it is about sartorial tradition, identity, gender, and sexuality. This critically acclaimed book is available for sale through the link in the chat box. Monica L. Miller is an Olin professor of English and Africana studies at Barnard Co College, where she specializes in African-American and American literature and cultural studies. Welcome, Monica, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Angela. I am delighted to be here at the <laughs> National Arts Club. And well, well I, I was just, you know, I, we're so excited to see all the wonderful images that you have um, from, from your book and from your research. I thought that before we begin, I was hoping that you can set the stage by first defining Black dandyism. What does Black dandyism mean to you? Is it just about clothing? Or is it something more? I like to, and you'll see this in my talk, I really like to think about dandyism as not just about clothing, but I define it as clothing, gesture, and wit, right? And a combination of those three. So I'm really interested not only in the clothing, but how the person in some ways occupies the clothing, right? And sort of makes it move in some ways, as you'll see in my talk, through time and space. That's wonderful. And you know, um, we were just discussing this a little earlier. You are the first scholar to follow this cultural history through the lens of a black dandy, starting from the first dandy, which you identify in Europe in the 18th century and continuing onto black dandyism in early America. Um, and we can't wait to hear more about that. So there's clearly incredible deep research that went into this book. What was the research process like to write a book like this, which is really the first of its kind? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, the research process was fascinating um, because I didn't actually know what I would find. <laughs> so um, it began, this book began um, in a uh, graduate school seminar, actually, where I was reading about, and I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. I was reading about um, and about and the work of um, the uh, African-American uh, uh, kind of icon, W.E.B. Du Bois. So um, I was looking, I, was, I, I found a weird footnote in an article that said that he had been characterized as a dandy and was very upset about that. So I was like, hmm, why? So after looking into that um, footnote and talking to a few of my um, professors, you know, one of my professors said, if you want to understand that, you might have to go back to 18th century England, right? So then I started doing history on, uh, started doing a, a study of dandyism in Europe and then tried to figure out like when, right? Um, when race became a part of it. And it turned out that in some ways, race, uh, class, uh, sexuality, nationality was always a part of that story. So then as soon as I could see it in history, it was sort of easy to kind of put it together. It's fascinating. That's so fascinating because, you know, as I'm going through your book, um, you open our eyes to things that afterwards we can't unsee anymore. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Um, a reminder to the audience that the link to purchase Professor Monica 
Monica's book, Slaves to Fashion, Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Di uh, Diasporic Identities in the chat box. We will also have a brief Q&A at the end of Monica's um, presentation to answer some questions from the audience. So please type your questions into the chat box. Uh, Monica, we are all ready to learn all about um, the history of Black Dandyism. So please take it away. Thank you. Sir. Um, I saw somebody mention this in the, in the chat, um, but um, as many of you know, this week we lost um, Andre Leon Talley, um, who uh, for me was a major inspiration um, for this book and somebody whose um, career and, um, and fashion I have been following um, for most of my adult life. So I would like to um, dedicate this talk to him um, and, um, and I just hope that he is, um, you know, uh, out of, um, or maybe still in, we can talk about that too, the chiffon trenches. Um, so this is, this is for, um, this is for Andre. I'd like to begin with an epigraph and then interest, introduce you to a few fabulous men. I'd like you to note how within the black repertoire style, which mainstream cultural critics often believe to be the mere husk the wrapping, the sugar coating on the pill has become itself the subject of what is going on. Think of how these cultures have used the body as if it was, and often it was, the only cultural capital we had. We have worked on ourselves as the canvases of representation. And that's a quote from Stuart Hall in his article, What is the Black in Black Popular Culture? This portrait of Ike Ude a Nigerian-born, London-educated, and New York-based artist graces the cover of my book, Slaves to Fashion. Ike lives his life as a dandy and explores the history, performativity, and aesthetic economies of dandyism in his work. He is, for me, one of the modern Black dandy figures whose literal and symbolic body of work exhibit what I call redemptive narcissism in my book, Slaves to Fashion. For me, Ike has demonstrated, as many other modern dandies do, how Black people in the diaspora have consistently transformed moments of capture with caprice. How initially subject to an imperial and colonial politics, as well as the fashion system that was developed alongside of it, they have made fashion their slave, or at the very least, put it to or in their service. What drew me to Ike as a subject was not only his fabulousness, but his intelligence, well illustrated in this portrait and this series, Sartorial Anarchy, which I'll talk about a little bit later. His photographs are not merely aspirational self-portraits designed to critique the world of fashion as a theater of the absurd, but rather a trans-historical archive of colonial and imperial encounter, cosmopolitanism and globalization written and worn on the black body. In the early 19th century, Scottish philosopher Thomas Carlyle defined the dandy as, and this is him, a clothes wearing man, a man whose trade, office, and existence consists in the wearing of clothes. Every faculty of his soul, spirit, purse, and person is heroically consecrated to this one object, the wearing of clothes wisely and well. Carlyle is being satirical here, but even so, he's counterintuitively identified the importance of dandyism and performative dress for Black people. Dressing wisely and well or with intelligence and flair has been a necessary part of African-American culture and the culture of the Black diaspora, even preceding the moments that Africans arrived on these shores. It was too often a matter of survival, not merely of frivolity. The slave trade and the complicated identities or blacknesses it produced can be told in the history of cloth. Europeans, Europeans traded cloth and fancy items of dress for African captives. When transported to the Americas, those captives were stripped of their native dress and, and given plain coarse clothing. Early accounts of slave appearance emphasize that the enslaved traded for or saved up for small accessories that they could affix to their clothing to distinguish themselves from the masses a button, a ribbon, something shiny. The enslaved often liberated clothing from their masters in order to be free and escape bondage. Dressing across race, class, and gender lines increased a slave's mobility in actual and symbolic terms. Dress codes regulated the fabrics and styles and cuts available to captives and sometimes free blacks. 
the overdressed could be corrected and critiqued via mob violence. As a clothing practice that begins and flourishes in moments of political and cultural transition, dandyism is a powerfully interrogative phenomenon. It questions easy readings of and loyalties to race, gender, sexuality, class, and nation. Clothes wearing men and women exhibit what Uday calls a luxurious deliberation of intelligence in the face of boundaries. And I love that phrase, especially in relationship to Andre Leon Talley. They exhibit a knowingness about seeing and being seen, an incisive sense of the sometimes fabulous, but always serious optics of race and racialization. Black dandies, black style. Though most popularly perceived as a mere trend of fashion in the late 18th and 19th century British culture, a dandy's look, the clothing on his performative body has always signified more than excessive attention to personal style. Indeed, when thinking about the dandy in general and the black dandy in particular, we must remember that the Oxford English Dictionary defines a fop from the 15th century as one foolishly attentive to and vain of his appearance, dress, or manners, and a dandy by 1780 as one who studies above everything else to dress elegantly and fashionably. Anyone can be in vogue without apparent strategy but dandies commit to a study of the fashions that define them and an examination of the trends around which they can continually redefine themselves. My book, Slave to Fashion, argues that as a social practice that mounts a critique against the hierarchies that order society, dandyism initially appears to be a phenomenon naturally suited to Africans experiencing attempted, an attempted erasure or reordering of their identities during the slave trade and European colonization and imperialism. For black dandies, self-fashioning is not only a philosophical or psychological boom, but initially a more practical concern. In order to survive the inhumanity of the slave trade, those Africans arriving in England, America, or the West Indies had to fashion new identities and make the most out of the little that they were given or allowed to retain. Significantly, their new lives nearly always began with the issuance of a new set of clothes. A manipulation of the relationship between clothing, identity, and power, dandyism affords Africans and later African-Americans and Afro-Europeans an opportunity to dress their way from slavery to freedom, to restyle given categories of identity, and to turn slaves into selves. The first dandy I'd like you to meet is this elegant man, Julius Subis. Subis was among a very select group of enslaved black people and servants in 18th century England called prestige or luxury slaves. These boys and men were among the very first dandies that I've been able to identify in an Anglo-American context. They were perhaps the first group of the dandified enslaved able to make fashion their slave. When discussing these men in the history of black dandies and more generally, I coined the phrase crime of fashion to capture the dynamic in which these men were embroiled and which they took advantage of. Subis himself was at once the victim of a vogue as well as a traitorous trendsetter himself. Born in Jamaica and brought to England in 1764, he was the most visible and most famous of the servants who as early as the 1650s had been used by royalty, the aristocracy and later upstart merchants as the ultimate expression of their wealth. Called pet people or darling blacks, these young black boys were dressed in the latest fashions, sometimes educated in the genteel arts and were companions and confidants to their masters and mistresses. As such, they were expressly not used as labor and were therefore particularly emblematic of slavery's conspicuous consumption of black bodies. As a former slave, manumitted and adopted by the Duchess of Queensbury, who was seen here in this um, print fencing with Subis. As also an athlete, a coach, an entertainer, a ladies man, and a quite visible member of the emerging black community, Subis was theatrical, spectacular, and a complication to perceptions of blackness, and especially of black masculinity and sexuality. Often clad, and this is a description from the period, in a powdered wig, white silk breeches, very tight coat and vest with an enormous white neckcloth, white silk stockings, and diamond buckled red heeled shoes. Sabisa's dress and behavior was both outrageous and appealing. 
Despite and because of his extravagance, Soubise was loved and admired by all until, and this is again from the period, he suddenly changed his manners and became one of the most conspicuous fops in town. Inexplicably or not, around age 19, Soubise transformed himself from a black in fops clothing to a fop who was black. Of course, the transition from one to the other was hardly smooth and somewhat impossible to complete in an age of slavery. Rumored to have taken a private apartment, he soon assumed the habits of an extravagant man of fashion, which included entertaining visitors in rooms filled with hothouse flowers, pursuing an array of women via song and poetry, taking boxes at the opera, joining expensive men's clubs, and riding around town in his own post chaise and four, driven by a white groom. Subi seemingly capitalized on his forced spectacularity by transforming white excess into black luxuriance. Subi's tale though ends and begins in boundary crossings. While his biographers treat the incident differently, they all mention that his years as London's most spendthrift and foppish cad ended when he was sent abroad to mend his wild ways from the high life of the rakes. Considered an Othello from an early age, his sexuality was as much on display as his color or foreignness. And according to some, the black fop actually left to hush up his relationship and some say assault of one of the Duchess's maids. Dressed in the latest fashions as a boy while at the Duchess's side, he was feminized and made into an object whose own desires could be ignored. With the Duchess's purse in his hand as an adult, he was seemingly a different kind of curiosity able to act sometimes on his own will. Although a product of the confused desires of the British elite, and indeed a man whose very body and its adornment in lace and silks embodied that disorder, Subis could not or would not be allowed to spread that bewilderment further. Forced into exile, he sailed for Calcutta in July of 1777, where he lived for 21 years as the master of his own fencing and riding school before he was killed at age 44 by a fall suffered in breaking a horse for the British government. As a solution for what to do with dandified adolescent black boys who were often imputed as drunks, lechers, those who lacked a sense of responsibility and who had no loyalty, again, a quotation from the period, exile to the East or West Indies was not an unusual choice. These boys and men were often sometimes helped to prosperity as was Subis and sometimes enlisted back into the fields. One might speculate here that the fancy clothes worn by these boys also functioned as a cover for a perceived sexual threat that emerged as they matured. Thus their lives reveal a difficult connection between their social hypervisibility and invisibility, between luxury and labor and the expression of and policing of pleasure. Inside the Minstrel Mask. Meet Dandy Jim from Carolina, a character made famous by the 19th century's most popular entertainment, the Blackface Minstrel Show. Narcissistic to a fault, Dandy Jim was certainly one of the figures whose signature song boasted of a self-aggrandizement that titillated with equal parts threat and appeal. A particularly potent force in the antebellum minstrel show, Dandy Jim and his fellows, Zip Coon and Longtail Blue, provided a way for the minstrel show's working class immigrant white performers to ask, what if? What if blacks were free? What if they had money, access to education, unchecked social, cultural, and economic mobility? The black-faced Dandy costume often an elaborate misquotation of elite fancy dress and the character's pretentious, loudmouth, ridiculous, and yet funny and provocative behavior answered these questions. Although the early minstrel show presents the dandy in slightly different guises, what remains constant about, his, about its portrayal of blacks and fancy clothing is the figure's association with sexual threat and class critique. In the case of the blackface dandy, the donning of elite clothing translated not only to a desire for social mobility, but also for the most extreme form of integration, interracial sex. The phallic nature, which you can see in this print of the dandy's iconography and mischief cannot be denied. What is surprising about black-faced dandies is actually the degree to which they succeed 
at what is called their plan of insurrection and intermixture. For example, when Dandy Jim's fellow, um, Longtail Blue, has his long blue coat split by a watchman or a policeman in his song, a clear assault on his phallic, pa phallic power, it is very quickly repaired. Even though Blue, Longtail Blue, does not complete a conquest of any white gals at the end of his song, which is his intention, he is still very much in the chase. Dandy Jim is involved in similar antics, a narcissist in cutting, intending to cut a figure at the ball, and in some versions of his song, Woo Lovely Dinah, into providing him with eight or nine young Dandy Jims of Caroline, Dandy Jim boasts of a sexual prowess that is definitely linked to his appearance. Unlike Longtail Blue, Dandy Jim's lust remains with his, within his own race and social conventions. Lovely Dinah is a fellow Black who Jim actually marries in his song. However, Dandy Jim's quest to populate the world with as many little Black dandies as he can is nevertheless threatening. Longtail Blue, Zip Coon, and Dandy Jim menace even as they amuse, revealing the affinity between effeminacy associated with extreme attention to dress and appearance and a hyper-masculinity linked to stereotypes about race and blackness. Both states of being were, were to provide evidence for the unfitness of black men and black people in general for citizenship. Despite the fact that the black dandy's sexual threat is almost always figured as heterosexual, we cannot forget that the gals being pursued in the minstrel show by white men in blackface are themselves white men in blackface and drag. In fact, the dandy on stage, a white performer in blackface, often cross-dressing in terms of race, gender, and class, comes alive in the spirit and performance of these anxieties in the production of a queerness that lingers after the curtain goes down and the burnt cork is removed. Men who were different. Though not at all new to Americans as a figure of racial, cultural, and social conflict and negotiation, the black dandy was nevertheless taken on and embodied in the early 20th century by African-Americans in Harlem to exhibit a new self and cultural regard post-emancipation. With a critical mass of so-called new Negroes resident in an urban area for the first time, African-Americans seized the potential to refashion themselves as a group. Newly visible to the world and each other, African-Americans began to show off themselves to themselves and to convert their visibility into social and cultural regard. But it was not just sheer numbers of people and a new neighborhood, Harlem, that forced the Harlem Renaissance and its dandies into being. But more importantly, it was the diversity of the people there and their collective outlook that was the crucial factor. Regardless of whether they came from the South, the West Indies, or even Africa, what this group had in common was attitude. Indeed, display and demonstration of new Negro attitude is not only characteristic of the Harlem Renaissance, but also to the place of dandies and dandyism or group and self-fashioning within it. Witness one very prominent public exhibition of black cultural self-assurance and the power of visual display in the era the Hamilton Lodge Drag Ball. And this is a portrait of um, Bonnie Clark, who was um, a part of this uh, uh, subculture. One of Harlem's most famous and well-attended annual events in the 1920s and 1930s. A signature of an emerging and queer Harlem style, the Hamilton Lodge Ball demonstrated to Harlem, New York, and the world that this new Negro metropolis was indeed a particular and fantastic place to seek modern blackness. 1920s Harlem was a place, according to, James, according to writer James Weldon Johnson, that was more than a community. It is a large scale laboratory experiment in the race problem in which sexuality, gender, and fashion played a major part. Staged every spring since 1869, the Hamilton Lodge Ball had instituted a new urban and modern street-based display of black extravagance by the early 1920s. According to historian of Gay New York, George, George Chauncey, in the early 20th century, drag queens appeared regularly in Harlem's streets and clubs, and outside of the restaurants, clubs, and cafes on 7th Avenue. Gay men in particular were seen cavorting with wild, and he spells that W-I-L-D-E, abandon. 
As it celebrated the visual display of Harlem's most controversial new Negroes, the Hamilton Lodge Ball gained popularity steadily from the early 1920s when its status as the drag ball in New York and the nation was emerging. In the 1930s, the ball drew as many as 8,000 participants and observers, and it was covered in, um, in the popular press. And this is another picture of, um, of, um, of Bonnie Clark. Um, a night in which the so-called female impersonators, black and white, competed for prizes based on fabulousness of costume and comportment, the Hamilton Lodge festivities demonstrated the fact that at times Harlem was, quote, wide open to those interested in gender performance and sexual experimentation, marked by a combination of fancy dress and saucy attitude. New York society folks, actors, entertainers, local and national celebrities dressed to the nines joined the Queens at the Rockland Palace and once um, in Madison Square Garden. The ladies, and this is the uh, quotation from the popular press, the ladies were clad in the likes of a low cut gown with a silver fox for a yoke and other original creations, such as a white gown with a pleat ruff of the same material and backless, my dear. The main event was a grand march that proceeded with much laughter, hip slapping and head tossing past an official and non-official judges eager to appreciate the gorgeous, thrilling spectacle. And this is again the press, a veritable glimpse of fairyland, whoops. While part of the playful tone in the reportage, the whoops intimates the slippage going on here as, as Harlem, the black Mecca became a gay metropolis, an experimental site for redefining those categories by which we constitute identity. In early 20th century Harlem, an explosion of organza and a finely tuned attention to the politics of dress indicated a change in conceptions of blackness and the relation of, black, of race and blackness to sex, gender, and class. In the balls, the immense popularity of an interracial event featuring male and female cross-dressers demonstrated that Harlem had, had indeed become a queer place and a place in which modern blackness was expressed publicly through this fabulous queerness. Even one of Harlem's most respectable cultural workers, W.E.B. Du Bois was not immune to the spirit of the age. As the black community upgraded its look in 1920s Harlem, he would have seen new Negro dandies erupting everywhere at the balls, in the guise of well-dressed doctors and lawyers inhabiting brownstones on Strivers Row, as flamboyantly dressed street peddlers of women in hooch, as dancers, musicians, and patrons at speakeasies, artists ensconced in salons, and even in the office of the NAACP. Pictured here as a young undergraduate at Harvard, truly dapper in his plaid three-piece suit, later in the 1920s, Du Bois was the quintessential race man. Activist, politician, and writer in all genres, Du Bois used the dandy and his queerness, not the dandy's queerness, not Du Bois's, to deconstruct and reimagine blackness in his fiction primarily. Even though he failed later in life to acknowledge the presence of black gay people in his work and family life, Du Bois was nevertheless surprisingly open to formulating a revolutionary queer masculinity in his early fiction. In fact, in, one of his, in, the, in his own favorite of his own books, 1928's Dark Princess, Du Bois creates a character, dandy activist Matthew Towns, who carries a cane and gloves, and again, this is Du Bois, and wears a new suit that is smartly accessorized with a dark crimson tie that burned with the red in his smooth brown face. Confident in the knowledge that he would be treated as he was dressed, Matthew is a melancholic brooder, self-diagnosed, and again, this is Du Bois, a mass of quivering nerves and all too delicate sensibility. Described by Du Bois as curiously weak and sensitive in places where he should not have been, Matthew is all sympathy, all yielding, all softness, prone to patronize art galleries when he should be at work. In the course of the novel, despite his dandyish proclivities, he becomes the leader of a revolution of the darker peoples of the world, but is waylaid for a time by romance and a seeming inability to avoid the, the finer things in life. Though his relationship with the princess of the book's title, Princess Cautilia, the dark South Asian princess, brings him into the revolution as leader and representative of the African diaspora, the romance fizzles when they become too distracted by time-honored dandy activities in which they indulge themselves. Sensual lovemaking, visits to museums and art galleries, dining on fine wines and food, and listening classical music. 
Matthew realizes the need for reform after Cautilia leaves him and plans somehow to transform himself into what he calls a perfect unit of democracy. A man with a different set of values, a new dream of living, a paragon of men who were different. Despite this idea of the new man, Du Bois's Danzy and the Council of Darker People never managed their revolution, at least within the bounds of the text. Nevertheless, Du Bois's Dandy attempts to reconfigure notions of blackness, masculinity, and cosmopolitanism in the service of a black liberation and realization of his goal that black people the world over can become recognized as what Du Bois calls co-workers in the kingdom of culture looking both ways. The Black Dandy Archive in my book challenges, challenges us to do what one critic of contemporary African art calls look both ways. Looking both ways forces us to see not only the constructedness of the categories of identity, but also the historicity and strategic nature of their construction. By way of conclusion, and it's a long way of conclusion, <laughs> I'd like to finally introduce you to artist Yinka Shonabare who working within the black dandy tradition, hopelessly and fascinatingly confuses the black dandy's look both ways. When describing how he's perceived in the art world, London born Nigerian uh, raised Shonabari understands that when people see an artist of African origin, they think, oh, he's here to protest. Shonabari admits that yes, okay, I'm here to protest, but adds provocatively, but I'm going to do it like a gentleman. It's going to look very nice. A self-confessed beauty hugger, Shonabari has used the beautiful and especially his meticulously tailored fabric sculptures and gorgeously styled photographic narratives to remind us of the importance of appearance and the tendency of appearance to deceive. Despite the fact, or maybe even because, Thomas Carlyle once pejoratively described the dandy as inspired with cloth, a poet of cloth, who dresses to live and lives to dress, Shonabari dares to make it true on his own terms. A self-described trickster, he uses fabric, clothing, and dandyism to entertain, to seduce, to provoke, to challenge, and to be historically relevant. In pieces like this one, which is called Big Boy, Affectionate Men, and Gay Victorians, displays of African and European hybridity, we experience a fantastically simple and witty critique of the demands of cultural and artistic authenticity. 19th century dress and African fabric reveals the exploitation of Africans that fueled the imperialist project and resulted in the enormous wealth that was most lavishly displayed in Victorian dress, salons, and estates. Given that the fabric is also indelibly associated with African pride, independence, and nationalism, surely these sculptures must be read as manifestations of the empire striking back, fashioning a new view of what it means to be African, British, and of the African diaspora then and now. Marking his deep and ironic understanding of history, these sculptures gloriously display the wit that characterizes our famous fashioned creature, the dandy. Affectionate men, gay Victorians, are seemingly embody the black dandy or the African dandy's revenge, literally and figuratively materialized. But do they? Since Shonabari always insists on the humor and jouissance of his work, saying pleasure is central to my practice, we should never forget that great poems of words or cloth stand up to multiple interpretations. Looking at these sculptures carefully, we see that the hem of the fabric says Dutch wax, where we might expect some indication of the fabric's Africanness made in Nigeria, Fabric a Senegal. Instead, a little investigation reveals that this fabric is not African or even really Dutch. Originally from Indonesia, where it was handmade using laborious and expensive batik methods, the cloth was brought to Europe by 19th century Dutch and British colonials involved in the East India trade. These colonials manufactured it in Holland and Manchester, England for export back to Indonesia. The Indonesians rejected this industrially made cloth as a bad imitation of their own artisanal fabric. 
Therefore, it was re-exported to Europe and then to, West and then to the West African colonies where it became valued by Africans initially for not being African at all, but foreign. In Africa, the fabric became especially popular after independence movements in 1950s and 60s, when its designs were altered to reflect specifically African concerns or West African concerns. Cheaper cotton versions of the fabric are now produced in Africa and until recently, Japan, but the most fancy version of the fabric, the super or Dutch wax is still manufactured only in Holland and primarily in Manchester, England for export to the African diaspora. Therefore, this material sign of authentic Africanness is both a lie and the truth of black identity. While a sculpture like Big Boy challenges us, I'm gonna go back to Big Boy, it's my favorite one, um, challenges us to fill in a context around the dandified figure, right? Most of Shonabari's sculptures are displayed without a background as naked tableau, and they are amb ambiguously raced and gendered. Shonabari's photographic work presents the dandy's context in the same kind of meticulous wry detail. Here, the dandy as Shonabari plays him is definitively African and his setting is at once the enlightenment, Victorian England and altogether contemporary. In fact, this piece, or this is one in a series called the diary of a Victorian dandy in this series, he takes on the black dandy figure more particularly as the vehicle of a productive confusion as he continues to intrigue and increasingly, I think, to warn of the potential dangers of the dandy's crimes of fashion. Diary of a Victorian Dandy, which is from 1998, startles. Shot like film stills, diary consists of five large format photographs Chronicling, chronicling the day of a black dandy from his morning toilet through to his very late night or early morning revels. Diary imagines that the black dandy's origins in the, in, in the Enlightenment and Victorian England by also bringing the figure to the threshold of the 21st century. In this series, Shonabari references the 18th century painter William Hogarth's iconic rendition of the dandy's history and his engagement with representations of blacks caught up an elite milieu. Early in his career, Hogarth painted portraits of aristocratic families, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit muddy, um, aristocratic families in which the presence of ostent ostent ostentatiously dressed black servants clearly emphasized their status as objects of conspicuous consumption. Later in his career, just as some of these servants were making real and symbolic bids for their freedom, as was Subis, Hogarth also made paintings and prints that recorded the life and viewpoints of the lower orders, black and white. For example, art historian David Dabadeen reads the ostent ostentatiously, I have to stop saying that word, ostentatiously dressed black servants in some of Hogarth's best known work. For example, this, this um, painting, which is plate four or the fourth um, uh, piece of, a, of a, a piece called Marriage a la Mode, as the only civilized people depicted in the painting. An elaborate scene that takes place in a mistress's bedroom where she's being entertained by an Italian opera singer who is over on the left and attended by her lover, friends and servants, Marriage a la Mode elaborately comments on the dissipation of the wealthy. Presiding over the scene in the middle of the painting is a black man serving chocolate with a sm sly smile on his face who seems to know that his mistress is going to have no success with the opera singer, who is more interested in the castrato uh, sitting next to him. And that's the man with the, with the um, uh, short uh, braids. Objects in the room, among them empire-derived American and African objets on the floor in front of the singer, reinforce the artist's point of view that these elite spaces are characterized by loose morals and economic exploitation. In depicting the black perspective, Hogarth leads the viewer to the inevitable conclusion that white elites have been corrupted by their ultra fashionable self-gratifying way of life. This perspective shift revises and represents or represents the place of the ostentatiously dressed black by styling him as the visible and visual critique within this elite narrative. In Diary of, an, of a Victorian Dandy, Shonabari explicitly references the black boys of marriage a la mode 
while explicitly, while explicitly inserting them into another Hogarthian cautionary tale, The Rake's Progress, which is from 1735. In the original sequence of The Rake's Progress, we see the process by which a dandy is made and unmade. The first scenes introduce us to a young, you can follow along as I'm talking, to a young Tom Rakewell, recently graduated from Oxford, who has not just inherited his father's wealth and in celebration is being outfitted in a costume and environment appropriate for his new aristocratic station. Tom's costume seems to fit him well and he is soon gambling and whoring with the best of them. Quickly becoming insolvent, Tom is arrested and forced to marry a wealthy widow to pay his debts and restore his fortune. Predictably, he continues his rakish ways and too late pledges reform. Reform does not last and Tom soon finds himself in jail and later in the madhouse. A comment on the excesses of luxury and the de and degeneracy on the individual, the class and the nation, the rake's progress both delights in and censures the young man in question, drawing with equal relish his rise and fall. Hogarth's rake is Shonabari's dandy, transported to Victorian England and present day London. His dandy makes progress as well, but through the stages of his own pleasure and not towards any punishment. Given that this is the dandy's diary rather than a rake's progress, what we look at in Shonabari's sequence is what the black dandy wants us to see. Here, instead of being relegated to the margins of a print, this dandy is central to each image. Instead of wearing a livery and being at someone else's service, this dandy is served again and again. There is no scene here in which the dandy does not appear totally in control. Indeed, this image, three hours, shows the dandy not only being served, but serviced as he lounges in, pink, in a pink waist, waistcoat on the bed, surrounded by servants and various stages of sexual exploration of him and each other. Throughout the sequence, all eyes devour him when he is either in the bedroom or the boardroom. Fawned over, attended to, obeyed, and finally applauded, this Victorian dandy demands notice. In all of these images, his clothing is the richest and most colorful as all others are positioned, it seems, to get a good view. Finally, at 1900 hours, he is being toasted for his accomplishment, for inserting his interrogative body within the frame, for triumphing in his aestheticism. The stage qualities of these images and the settings in which they appear do impact how we read the black dandy and the narcissism within them. Though seemingly triumphant, Shonabari as Victorian dandy within these scenes is both, or seems both in command and is awkwardly positioned, alienated within them. The dandy's body is stiff and still, his face is blank, and in marked contrast to the easy to please faces and much more expressive bodies of his servants, attendance and audience. Though the figure's disposition in these photos is partly due to Shonibari's own physical limitations, as he was um, nearly crippled by a viral infection while in his first year of art school, his dis-ease within the frame is both actual and symbolic. The dandy's narcissism in these elaborate self-portraits, both redeems and traps, is liberating and a prison. Shonabari's transformations of Dutch waxclaw, Hogarth, and the history of black dandyism reveals that he is extremely attentive to the politics of the dandy's characteristic irony. Given that like Oscar Wilde, Shonabari wants to look at his practice in the area of the poetic, outside of moralizing or anything that resembles what he calls straight speech. He remains a trickster, black and queer, because dandies are, whether the vehicle or the subject of critique, never what they seem. Ude, redo, postscript. From these earlier moments, clothing and dress, especially in the outrageous form of dandyism, has been provocative, a sartorial manifestation of a contest between slavery and freedom, stylization and self-fashioning. Ike Ude's sartorial anarchy series takes these, which is more recent, takes these early African-American dress traditions 
and 19th century lessons of dandyism and telescopes them both into the past and the future across space and time. In this image, uh, Sartorial Anarchy number five, Uday employs, and I'm gonna read, this is the description that comes with the, with the image. Uday employs an English macaroni wig topped by the tiniest of electric blue fedoras from the 18th century. In transition with a 20th century French shirt, Yoruba uh, trousers from Nigeria, 1940s, American loafer shoes, 20th century, Zulu fighting stick, 19th, 20th century, and West European World War I spats, which are from around 1914 to 1918. The furniture and rug are of antique and thrift store origin, sourced from present day lower Manhattan. The otherworldly yet intimate mise-en-scene points to what Uday has called a future perfect in which people express themselves without reservation through and with the history of their representation and self-stylization. In this portrait and all the others in the Sartorial Anarchy series, and I'm just gonna run through a few right now, all of the dress that you see has been male dress at some point, not just in the history of the Black Atlantic, but in world history. Uday's revolutionary politics of style is designed to frustrate every expectation, yet at the same time, keep it real. About the history of dandyism and male dress and its relation to global colonial encounters, about the durability and irony of cultures of consumption, about the color field in art historical and also metaphorical terms, these portraits reveal the palimpsestic nature of the black dandy's adorned body. Over the last 20 years, studies of black expressive culture in the form of fashion and dress have exploded as popular culture has become increasingly black and style far more interesting than fashion. To borrow a phrase from a now defunct blog, The Seams, clothes are our common thread in every stitch, a story. For black people in particular, these stitches, their reparative function and ability to create the totally new are what fashions are fraught and fabulous sartorial style. Thank you. Um, terrific, thank you so much. This That was a beautiful and incredible presentation. And um, these are incredible images and stories. Um, I wanted to start off our Q&A with, with this one question, which is, what is it about clothing in Black dandyism that enables such a transformation and a critique of the existing systems? That is, that's a big question, right? Um, and um, let's see. I mean, I think for me, I mean, I really do take it back to, to the history and, and into that kind of initial moment, right? Um, where enslaved, people had to give up, right? The clothing that they had, right? Um, where, they had to, where they had to kind of give up the clothing that they had and to take on, right? A new set of clothes, right? And what's, what is, what's really kind of poignant and interesting to me about that moment, right? Um, is that the, when the enslaved were given a new set of clothes, I mean, that was a gesture at, right? Um, sort of creating uh, an amorphous group right, of laboring bodies, right? But one of the things that became really obvious to me as I was um, doing the research for the book and looking, looking at um, actually uh, uh, early accounts, right, of, um, of, uh, of um, kind of like emerging, emerging societies amongst the enslaved was like the constant noticing, right, that whenever, whenever um, an enslaved person had the opportunity they would, they would steal a piece of clothing, right? Mm -hmm. They would steal a button, they would steal a ribbon, they would steal, you know, they would steal or try to find something, right? That they could use to distinguish that clothing and in some ways distinguish themselves, oh. right? So, so there's this real way in which, you know, something as small as a button or a ribbon, right? I mean, ads can, can be a vehicle, right? For, for individuality, right? 
can be a vehicle for sort of like an emergence, right, of agency and a and a, and a really, um, you know, in in the in the most difficult of situations, right? It can be a way, right, for for a person to to signal their personhood, right? So I mean, so I think it was, you know, if you think about it from a, from a button to then like a full outfit, right? That's a really different thing. There are so many slave narratives where the protagonist talks about talks about the desire right to buy or to buy or procure um, a set of clothing that is their own as the gesture in some ways that will indicate their transition from slavery to freedom right yeah. Frederick Douglass talks about that in his in his um, in one of in one version of his slave narrative and you you talk a little bit or you write a little bit about that dynamic that social, uh, socioeconomic dynamic between um, these enslaved black um, men uh, and then the black dandies, their owners, and even the emergence of this conspicuous consumption that um, became more and more in vogue. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, that's that's the kind of like that's the the you know kind of irony of the title <laughs> of my title, right? It's sort of like thinking about the relationship between. Um, uh, slavery, selfhood, and consumption, right? So, um, you know, it, it, yeah. So, um, so I would say that, you know, one of the things, one of the um, threads that I also see happening as I, as I was recounting this kind of history has precisely to do with like, when does, for example, um, you know, the gesture towards individuality, um, towards like, you know, recognition and representation, like when does that kind of flip, right? To, to ostentation, to spectacularity, right? To something that seems, you know, excessive and, and extra, right? Um, you know, as somebody who studies, you know, uh, dress and fashion cultures within, within, within African diasporic um, peoples, I mean, I, I, am, I, am less, um, I am less critical of extra, right? Because I understand like where it comes from Right, and I understand extra as, in some ways, a gesture of um, uh, as a gesture of of a desire, right, for recognition, right, and sometimes not recognition for mainstream, you know, white culture, but also rec in intra-racial recognition, or actually a gesture towards pleasure, right, joy, um, you know, the impractical, right. So, so in some ways, you know, they're I, I read it along that kind of spectrum, right? Of, um, you know, somewhere between, you know, finding ways to distinguish themselves, right? And then a real excessive and sometimes beautiful, but still troubling celebration, right? Of, um, of that kind of um, joy. Um, I'm, uh, one of the things I discovered uh, in, in doing the research, especially when I was looking in the, um, I'm gonna say in America, like 17th and 18th, I mean, even early 19th century America, is that there were often, um, there were often moments, right, during the year um, that were, that where the enslaved were allowed, right, allowed, even encouraged, right, um, to let off steam. Right. So there would be certain days in the year that were, you know, festival days or, um, you know, in northern, I mean, in New England, there was um, during election day, there was a sort of parallel um, on election day. There was a sort of parallel, um, uh, again, kind of festival or um, kind of like celebration day for the enslaved. And during those moments, um, especially the especially those days that took place in the south, uh, the Enslaved were actually given clothing, right, um, by their um, by their masters or enslavers, given that given clothing and kind of told to kind of live it up for a day, right? Or often, I mean, we see this again in a lot of um, uh, kind of slave narratives. Often, um, slaves who worked in um, in um, in the in the house or so like house slaves were often um, given cast off clothing, like you know the the clothing from their um, from their um, enslavers that were that was that was you know used right. I mean last year's fashion, right? Um, there's a very famous kind of scene of this, and even in um, in um, 
in uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, right? And um, so, so this this happened all the time. So, th so there were there were there were many ways, right, that the enslaved could could come by fancy dress and clothing, and were encouraged sometimes to um, to uh, to use it, right. But in terms of it getting out of control, this happened all of the time because if you read the um, uh, ads for escaped um, slaves in the 19th century, so many of them say, you know, I'm looking for this person. They stole my entire wardrobe, right? And left town, right? So there's a way in which, I mean, the enslaved really understood very quickly, right? Um, the power, right, of clothing to signal status, Right and to sometimes even aid right in the in the trans in the transformation between an enslaved status and a free status. So you would have to change your clothes literally, right, in order to signal um, if you were kind of escaping. You would often have to change your clothes literally, um, and sometimes people also cross dressed in order to do this, right, in order to appear free, right, um, in um, in another location, right. So so the so that happened very frequently. Oh, I see. that's that's so fascinating. Um, this was a very uh, popular question, which oh, yeah. is, um, is dandyism restricted to men? Are there black female dandies as well? Dandyism is not restricted to men. I mean, I, um, the reason why I, in my book, although not in my kind of subsequent writing, but in my book, I focused on men is that they were easier to find in the historical record, right? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the reality of being an enslaved woman, right, um, meant that um, women were not allowed to be um, out in the public as much, say, so for example, when I talk about Subis as being, um, you know, sort of like chronicled in the newspapers and, you know, he was painted, people wrote about him in diaries, um, enslaved women didn't have the same freedom of mobility, so they were not they were not seen in the same way. Um, although, I mean, I have to say that when we think about uh, the American South in the kind of later 18th and early part of the 19th century, um, there um, enslaved women who were used, um, who were used in some ways um, sexually were also given, right? Um, they were given fancy dress, right? They were supposed to be wearing those kinds of clothes. At the same time, there were laws against women specific laws against women, black women, enslaved women, wearing certain fabrics, certain cuts of dress, right? There were, there were laws that were passed in New Orleans and also in, um, in South Carolina against that. So no, it's not, it's not, not at all um, a, um, a phenomenon of men, but it was easier for me to trace that through the historical record until I get to, um, until I get to in some ways, uh, the early part of the 20th century. Right, so, so it, it turns out that through, you know, black migration to Northern cities through the great migration, then we get a lot more um, historical, I mean, or the historical record becomes full of women, right? Um, uh, dressing to the nines, right? Um, in, in, really different, in really different ways. That's wonderful. Um, you just spoke about Subisa's transfer um, from Europe to India, and that seemed like a very abrupt transfer. Mm -hmm. um, why was that kind of transfer so common uh, during that time? Um, I, I don't know. If, I mean, the thing is, it seems abrupt <laughs> to us, but I don't think at the time it would have been, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think the kind of movement, um, exile, transfer um, of, um, of enslaved people who, who were not acting, right, um, according to their quote unquote station um, was, was relatively common, right? So um, because the British empire had that reach at the time, I mean, exile to, to a kind of quote unquote far away place um, was, was, was relatively common. There was a, there was a tremendous amount of movement um, of people of African descent between um, in the Anglo, you know, in the Anglophone world between, you know, England, the Caribbean, the United States, India, South Africa, there was a very, I mean, Australia, right? There was a tremendous amount of movement um, um, of people because the empire was so, was so vast. So, um, you know, people could end up in, in seemingly unlikely places, right? Um, if, um, 
you know, if if they were seen as as you know again acting beyond outside against their station. Um, Jay Mendez asks, um, you know, he asks, how were black dandy dandies uh, viewed by white men? Uh, were they seen as a threat or not as not as a threat? How how was how did black dandies um, uh, land in in the in their in a, more broadly in, uh, with white men? Yeah, I think I think that question um, differs over time. Mm. Right. Um, and uh, I can say so, for example, if we go back to Subis during that time period, because um, at least in England, although the situation would have been different in colonial America, um, you know, people who were dandified like Subis were few and far between. So they weren't necessarily seen as um, as threatening, but maybe silly. Right. Um, I would say that situation is really different. In, um, in 19th century America, um, where some black people were starting to um, be emancipated or were free for generations and you know, amassing a certain amount of wealth or cultural capital. I mean, I think those figures were, um, were much seen as much more threatening, which is why they were parodied, right? Um, in the blackface minstrel show, right? So um, I think you know there there are some accounts even in the 19th century of um, of black of well dressed black men being a, being physically attacked on the streets, right of um, of Philadelphia and Chicago, right. So so wealthy free black people who were sort of making their way in American society were very threatening, um, and um, you know I mean I think the minstrel show is just all about that anxiety, right. So yeah. Um. I thank you. There is there's this one lovely question that uh, Marie Smith asked, which is, are there any men currently in the entertainment industry that you would consider a black dandy? Um, it was this was wonderfully crowdsourced. So we had great <laughs> answers that came in. Um, oh, yay. ASAP Rocky, Billy Porter, Dandy Wellington, Prince, Little Richard, Andre 3000, um, uh, Hendrix. So uh, what would your list be uh, for um, uh -huh. contemporary black dandies? All of those people, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I have a pretty expansive uh, definition. Um, uh, all of those people, um, let's see who else. I have been, I've been think. I've been trying to think through, right? Um, little Nas X. I mean, I think I'm trying to figure out if he's a dandy or if, if, if I just love the way that he plays with fashion, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, Sometimes those categories get a little blurry for me. Right. But I really admire. Right. When when somebody is really going to take fashion and sometimes this kind of version of excess. Right. Maybe this is a 21st century millennial version of excess and just really, really work with it. I mean, I, I really I admire I admire that that um, uh, intelligence in the face of boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and um, M uh, M's. M S were D low as well. How was this? How how influential was dandyism, dandyism as an inspiration to popular music? You know, oh. uh, we, we, ASAP Rocky was, had was upvoted many many times. And so, uh, what what's your <laughs> view on their influence on uh, dandy yeah. the dandyism influence on their their music? I mean, in some ways, we we need to think about the entertainment industry, and this really also I mean, I see this happening early, also in the early part of the twentieth century, especially around Harlem and and Chicago and other places, right? I mean, the the entertainment industry actually actually um, requires, in some ways, right, um, uh, entertainers to to be to be larger than life, to be excessive, to use fashion, right, as part of their um, as part of their art, right. We can think of many, many musicians who have done that. And I think in the black tradition, that's really, really true. Um, to go back to thinking about the female dandy piece, um, one of the things that I found so interesting about um, uh, Janelle Monet, right? A couple of years ago was her refusal actually to do that when she's, when she was, during the time when she was only wearing the tuxedo, right? For her, right? I mean, which was a style, which was definitely, I mean, stylish and incredibly fashionable, but wasn't about, right? the excess, um, um, although it was about sort of hearkening back to um, 
other kind of uh, female performers in the 20th, in the early part of the 20th century who were active in the Harlem Renaissance, who were, and some of them, um, quote unquote, cross-dressers, right? Who wore tuxedos and were very important um, jazz women, right? So, so there's a way in which uh, dandyism is just a, a, an integral part, right? Um, of, of entertainment and, um, and therefore, you know, a really, a really important, you know, the relationship between music and clothing is, is all, is just really, you know, really very um, fascinating and, um, and I think important, right? Even if we think about it in terms of hip hop. Right. Right. That's where uh, bracket comes in. Yeah. I, you know, what's really incredible about your presentation and the book is, um, it, are the stories that you write uh, where it highlights um, the incredible personal risks that yeah. um, these individuals take um, to to make a statement through um, their their choice in clothing and style and black dandyism, and um, and the, the so you know the progress of mo the momentum that we have and then we we read about are hard won. So mm -hmm. what what do you think are some of the statements that black dandyism um, is making today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it, within, I think within um, one of the things that I, that I didn't get a chance to mention, but that I, that is always a part of this, right, is, is the kind of conversation that happens when we talk about dandyism between, and we brought this up at the little at the beginning, between this kind of excessive joy and, and ability to kind of self-fashion, right, versus, versus a real um, concern often um, in the black community about respectability, right? And the way that respectability is so tied, right? To, um, to um, the, the maintenance and exercise of rights, right? Of, um, of, of being seen, right? As proper people, um, as, you know, deserving of rights, right? So, so I mean, one of the things that I, I think a lot about um, uh, in relationship to that question is, is, I mean, there's a dandyism that's about excessivity. And then when I showed those issues, those pictures of Du Bois, there's a dandyism that's also about this like incredible, right? Respectability. Mm -hmm. um, and a respectability that sometimes is, is a gesture out to mainstream kind of white culture, but sometimes I think is really just like a kind of internal, um, internal, even, even individual sort of sense. Like dandyism is on the one hand, you know, uh, can be about being fabulous, right? But dandyism can also be just about being incredibly well put together, right? So it's not always about, you know, being, you know, what um, in the French context you would call butterfly dandy, right? It can sometimes be about, in an English context, a bro bummel dandy, right? Who is just about the kind of incredible cut of the suit, right? Everything being kind of completely and totally, um, you know, pressed, tucked, you know, um, fitted, right? So there, there are different, there are different forms of dandyism. I and mean, I think sometimes we need to pay attention, right? To, to what form, right? And then what is the gesture, right? That's being made? What is the, what is the critique? What is the joy? What is the, what is the reach, right? What is the ambition, right? When we're thinking about, um, when we're thinking about in some ways, the spectrum of dandyisms that we see historically. And then I think that we also can see, um, you know, kind of in, in, in our contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I, I wish we can keep you here forever, um, but I, I think that we're running out of time. So what we want to ask, all of us want to know, um, uh, you've done so much work for this book. It is a, an incredibly important piece of work uh, that you've, you've published. It's, um, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it's deeply researched. Um, so the question is, what are you working on next? Oh, um, thank you for that, for those kind words. Um, I can tell you what I'm working on next in terms of fashion. Um, I just finished um, writing a piece for an exhibition. I do a lot of work with exhibitions, which is really amazing, right? So I just finished writing a piece for an exhibition um, that's gonna happen at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, hopefully, what's hopefully next spring or later on this spring, um, called Africa in Fashion. 
And I wrote about a young um, Nigerian fashion designer called Orange Culture, um, who, um, who designs clothing um, for any and all genders. Um, I've written a piece recently on, um, for an exhibition that's gonna happen at FIT next year on um, hip hop and fashion. And that's, that one is primarily on the color pink in hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a piece right now that's about um, fashion and the literary um, that takes up the work of, um, of uh, uh, Pierre Moss. So um, uh, thinking about contemporary fashion, contemporary black fashion designers, right? And the ways in which they, um, they tell particular kinds of stories that are deeply historical, right? Deeply about representation. So that's the kind of fashion work that I've been doing um, uh, lately. I also work on another project that's completely unrelated, but, um, but that's the recent fashion work. That's, that's tremendous. You, you are a very, very busy uh, person and uh, thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, Monica, it's incredibly, it's, it's, it's an incredible honor to have you with us. Uh, for everyone, please check out her book in the link in the uh, chat box. Thank you to everyone who joined us um, and had such great questions. I am Angela Louie. This is Professor Monica L. Miller, and thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having me.